okay, Russia, the physical geography of Russia. So the first graphic I want to show you guys is this. Um, this It's actually the globe, and the part in the globe that is in green is the country of Russia. So a couple of th concepts or a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. The first is this, in which we discussed in one of the previous videos. Russia is actually the world's largest country, and it takes part or it's on part of two different uh, continents. So this is the continent of Europe. Russia is a small part of Russia is on the continent of Europe. It separates right around here, the Ural Mountains, right around here from the rest of Europe. But the majority of Russia is on the continent of Asia. The ma overwhelming majority of Russia is on the continent of Asia. This is China, where it is right here, uh, where the where my arrow is pointing now is the border of Russia and China. Um, one thing, another concept or another thing I'd like to bring your attention to is the fact that Russia has the world's longest continuous coastline. What that means is this. Um, there's more the country of Russia that touches water than any other country in the world. Sounds good. Sounds like Russia. It sounds like this will make Russia a very strong trading country, right? We're wrong. Um, because this, take a look at this map. This, where are we located? I'm sorry, on the globe. Russia is located very close to the Arctic Circle. Um, the Arctic, if you think back to our climate zones, this is the Arctic climate zone, which is extremely cold. So the majority of Russia is in the Arctic climate zone and the subarctic climate zone, which means that it's very, very, very cold. Very, very, very cold. And even though the majority of Russia touches um, or more of Russia touches water, than any other country in the world. Russia has very, very little access to water for trading or pretty much anything else because the majority of the water that touches Russia is frozen because of the climate zone that's located in. So in review, Russia is the world's largest country. It stretches across two continents, um, Europe and Asia. Russia also has the longest continuous coastline of any country in the world. And most of the coast lies along waters that are frozen for many months of the year. If you take a look at this picture, this is just an example. This is one picture of what the coastline of Russia looks like for the majority of the year. This is actually a sea. Um, so this is actually what it looks like in Russia. Russia's waterways look like for the majority of the year. So it's very hard um, for, for Russia as a country to, to prosper and trade. And we'll take a look at a few more pictures um, seeing that. So here are some more pictures, and they'll lead us directly into discussing the Black Sea and the importance of the Black Sea and uh, kind of discussing exactly what a warm water outlet is. But these for these next two pictures show, illustrate what how it is or the difficulties that you have to um, endure in order to travel the sea or the waterways around Russia uh, for the majority of the year. This is a ship. Uh, on its way to the Arctic Square, it's I mean to the Arctic Circle, has to get there, um, um, trying to navigate through the frozen water, very 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 difficult. Makes it extremely hard to trade in Russia. Now, this is something that you can do. This is actually another um, illustration showing people traveling um, by foot over the waterways of Russia. So very hard for ships, very very hard for ships to travel. Um, through the majority of the waterways in Russia. That illustrates why the Black Sea and warm water outlets are so important to the country of Russia. A lot of Russia's foreign policy um, has been has revolved around having access to warm water outlets. What exactly are warm water outlets? Cool. Great question. Here you go. Warm water outlets are bodies of water that do not freeze over the course of a year. Russia has very few of those because it is located in majority in the Arctic and subarctic climate zones. So very few bodies of water in Russia are not frozen um, during any time of the year. So when we say a warm water outlet, that just means that the bodies of water, these bodies of water do not freeze ever during the course of the year. If you think about the Mississippi River or the bodies of water here in Louisiana, never freeze, right? In Russia always frozen. It's the exact opposite in Russia. Uh, the majority of the time, they are frozen. And this first, number one, this is um, of the Black Sea. 
and it is one of the warm water outlets and what we'll do now is just to review just the warm water outlets that are in Russia I'll point them out to you it's a very small handful of them but they're essential to the trade of Russia this is where the majority of the trade and commerce occurs in this country so the first one is the Black Sea the second one is the Caspian Sea it's located right here uh, the Caspian Sea is the largest inland body of water in the world it's located right here the western border of Russia the Black Sea is in part mostly in Europe but part of it touches with Russia the next one is the Volga River uh, the Volga River is called the Mother Volga because two-thirds of Russia with water traffic uh, travels along this river it provides hydroelectric power to Russia and up to about a third of Russia's usable, usable water. So look, even though this says number three is the Volga River, the Volga River actually goes from the Barents Sea all the way here into the empties into the Caspian Sea. The majority of the commerce or the majority of the traveling by water commerce of, this, of the largest country in the world occurs right here on this relatively small river um, when you think about the size of the country and the reason is it's because it's not frozen the majority of the water in Russia uh, the majority of the bodies of water in Russia do not freeze over Lake Biakel it's the deepest freshwater lake in the world and it's estimated to contain 20 percent of the earth's total supply of fresh water and the next one is the Amur River it forms part of the border of Russia uh, between Russia and China. Remember, to the south of China of Russia is China. The next concepts we'll touch bases on that we'll cover are the uh, the mountain ranges that are located in Russia, and there are two that we will spend uh, time on or time reviewing. The first one is the Caucasus Mountains, and they form the border between Russia and Southwest Asia. You should remember these mountain ranges from your Europe Physical Features quiz and the second one are the Ural Mountains and they form a natural boundary uh, between European Russia and Asian Russia so right here the Ural Mountains serve as a boundary or a natural border between the part of Russia that lies in Europe and the part of Russia that lies in Asia um, this moves us now to discussing the human environmental interaction now, doing, due to the great size and the harsh climate of Russia, we know that Russia is the largest country in the world and that also the majority of the country is located in the Arctic and subarctic climate zones. Very large, extremely cold. Um, the Russian people have had to adapt to their environment, which means, of course, that they have, um, they've had to make changes to themselves and also to modify to, the, to their environment which is actually change make changes to the environment one instance of or one example of the Russian people modifying their environment is the railroads the, the construction of railroads the construction of waterways uh, the best example of this is the Trans-Siberian Railroad it is the world's longest continuous rail line and I wanted to use this particular graphic I wanted you guys to have an understanding of just how large this thing is okay so the blue represents the transcontinental railroad and if you, I'm, transcontinental railroad which means that it goes across Russia, the continent of Russia or the continent of Asia actually uh, but take a look at this look how long this is this railroad goes from here from one end of Asia to the other if you just take a look for comparison you'll see it's larger than the country of India this one railroad uh, Kazakhstan longer than Iran longer than Turkey um, it would if it stretched from Europe it would go from one end of Europe to probably halfway through Russia you can go through most of northern Africa if you lay this track it could go all the way to northern Africa tremendous 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 accomplishment okay this railroad is extremely long and once again we're just looking at the blue because the red are those are connecting um, connecting train routes but an extremely long train route um, and we're just going a little bit further or digging a little deeper into the concept of human environmental interaction in Russia and we'll talk a few about a couple things the first is of course we've discussed this again and this is a reoccurring theme is that the effect of industrialization of what it's had on Russia um, just like everywhere else 
industrialization has led to the pollution of both Europe and Russia several different ways right we discuss water the dumping of industrial waste sewage and garbage um, the air pollution by the burning of coal and other fossil fuels soil um, storage containers containing leaking toxic waste these are all concepts that we're familiar with that we see on the news here every day, right? Uh, petroleum pipelines, those are important, especially to us in Louisiana. We're familiar with those things. Um, breaking and contaminating the soil with oil. Uh, pesticides damaging the farmland. Russia experienced, Europe and Russia, they experienced the same downfalls or the same pitfalls to human environmental interaction that most, that the advanced nations in the world that we all experience. Um, now this brings us to Chernobyl, which is an important, which is a very important topic when you discuss human environmental interaction, not only for Russia, but for Europe as well. And what Chernobyl was is this. This was a power plant located. It was a nuclear power plant, the same that we had, like similar to what we have here. We have right here in the United States. We have the one in St. James. I'm sorry, St. Francisville in Louisiana, north of Zachary, right? And what Chernobyl was, it was the worst nuclear power power plant disaster in the world. It took eventually over 500,000 rescue and evacuation workers worked on this at some point in time or another. It occurred right here in Kiev, um, right in right on the border, almost between Russia or the USSR at that time, because this occurred about 30 years ago. Um, the USSR at this time, Russia was still part of the Soviet Union and Europe. So it occurred right here. And about half a million rescue and evacuation workers were needed. Uh, the radioactive fallout, because there was an explosion, it was actually a nuclear explosion in Western uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. The fallout, which is like the nuclear debris from the explosion, it fell on Russia and Western Europe. So both Russia and Europe were contaminated with um, nuclear debris, with radioactive debris. These are the things that cause cancer. These are the things that cause birth defects in kids. So the estimates range from anywhere from 30,000 to 200,000 people died as a result, of either a direct result of the explosion, uh, but many more, the majority of the people died from radio from radiation poison or being exposed to radiation um, developing cancer at an early age children being born stillborn with birth defects so we're looking at about three thirty thousand anywhere from thirty thousand on the 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 very conservative end to two two hundred thousand people died on the other end and this is just this graphic here this is just an illustration of the after effects of Chernobyl. This is what it looked like of uh, the power plant. The whole power plant did not explode. That is important to understand. It was a part of the power plant explosion. So just one part, uh, one reactor exploded. One part of one reactor was not even one reactor, and it caused all of this damage. This is more of the fallout. This shows more of the fallout um, of the city and some of the damage that was done. Now, another thing that was important, the reason was this important, not just because of the physical damage, which was enough, right? You think up to 200,000 people dying um, would be enough. But also, one of the factors, uh, Chernobyl, uh, this tremendous disaster at Chernobyl ended up being one of the things that reformers, people who were looking to reform uh, the command economy, the totalitarian government of the Soviet Union, uh, they used this to push Glasnost. And what Glasnost was was a series of reforms. And what these reforms ended, eventually led to doing was the collapse of the government of the Soviet Union um, and its command economy. So this picture shows is Russia, right? This picture today is Russia of today. At the time of Chernobyl, all of these countries in green were part of the, the Russia or part of the Soviet Union at that point in time. So, but after Chernobyl and more importantly, more specifically, after Glasnost, um, the reforms that were acted, enacted that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of these countries declared their independence and broke away from the Soviet Union and from Russia. After Glasnost, um, once again, 
the the Soviet Union split into many smaller countries. All of these countries in green were at one point in time members of the Soviet Union. Okay, remember, highlight your homework learning targets and to answer all questions in bold lettering. The end. Have a good evening.